So good evening, I'm Gabriela Martinez. And on behalf of the entire staff of the Museum of Latin American Art, it's my pleasure to host tonight's program, Writing for Justice and Reclamation, a virtual poetry event. Before I introduce our participants, um, I really wanna thank Christopher Soto, one of tonight's readers, for assisting in organizing the event. And I would also like to recognize the event sponsors, the Kenneth T. and Eileen Norris Foundation without whose generosity this program could not have been possible. MOA also received support from the Robert Gumbiner Foundation, the Arts Council of Long Beach, and the City of Long Beach. If you're just joining us, please feel free to leave comments and questions using the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your Zoom browser. I'll be monitoring those windows throughout the program and I'll select some questions to post to the participants after the readings. So tonight's participants are Miriam Gurba, Fernandez, S.A. Smythe, and Christopher Soto. Each participant will speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A afterwards. So Miriam Gurba is a writer and artist. She's the author of the true crime memoir, Mean, a New York Times editor's choice. Oh, the Oprah Magazine ranked Mean as one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. Publishers Weekly described Gurba as having a voice like no other. Her essays and criticism have appeared in the Paris Review, Time.com, and Four Columns. She's shown in art and galleries, museums, and community centers, and she lives in Long Beach, California with herself. Faye Hernandez is an Inglewood-raised immigrant, trans, non-binary visual artist, writer, and healer. Currently, they are the president of the Advisory Board for Gender Justice Los Angeles. They've been published in Poetry, Oxford Review of Books, Frontier, NPR's Code Switch, Breakbeat Poets Volume 4, Latinx, Hank Magazine, amongst others. Faye is the author of Hood Criatura, Sundra's Publications of 2020, and Faye Collects Pokemon Plushies. S.A. Smythe is a poet, translator, and assistant professor of Black European Literary and Cultural Studies and Black Trans Poetics at UCLA. They are deeply invested in the coalitional project of Black Life, Black Study, and relishing other non-binary experiences. Smythe is, a com is completing a collection of poetry titled Proclivity about trans embodiment, emancipation, and a familial history of black migration between Jamaica, Britain, and Costa Rica. Their poetry and essays have been published or are forthcoming in Stranger's Guide, We Have Never Asked Permission to Sing, Poetry Celebrating Trans Resilience, The Johannesburg Salon, Catapult, Feminist Wire, OK Africa, and elsewhere. And Christopher Soto is a poet based in Los Angeles, California. He works at UCLA with the Ethnic Studies Research Centers and sits on the board of directors for Lambda Literary. He is currently working on a novel about indigo production in El Salvador during the 19th century. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to all of our panelists. And um, we'll start with Miriam. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start out by saying that I'm I'm really happy uh, to be here. I'm really I'm honored to to have been invited to participate. I don't have any sort of fancy or exciting background. I'm in front of the closet, <laughs> but I figured that was perfect for a queer event. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to read a very short chapter from, um, my memoir mean, I'm going to read a chapter titled Google Plex and I'm going to contextualize it just a little bit before I leap in. Um, mean is uh, a nonlinear memoir that, um, chronicles roughly 30 years worth of my life. And it focuses particularly on several um, traumatic experiences that affected me and other women in the community where I grew up. And these are um, sexually traumatic experiences. However, I'm not gonna read about that tonight. Um, instead, I'm gonna read, uh, like I mentioned, a very short chapter that is set during uh, my fifth grade year of elementary school. So I was 10 years old as this was unfolding. And um, I grew up in a town 
uh, named Santa Maria, which is located along the California coast. Um, the town uh, is predominantly Mexican. Um, and when I was growing up, um, we had a mayor named George Hobbs. He was incredibly racist and very, very xenophobic in a very Trumpian way. So when Donald Trump became president, I had heard the rhetoric that he spewed before. I knew that rhetoric because it was our mayor's rhetoric. And, um, and so uh, that rhetoric affected everybody in the community, including the children in the community. And so the white children in that community would parrot that rhetoric. And so I'm going to be reading a chapter that indicates um, uh, the trickle down effect of, um, of that kind of political hate speech. Googleplex. Although Ida was white, she sort of wasn't. She looked like Kurt Cobain. She attended bilingual classes with me and spoke and understood Spanish. She kicked it with Mexicans on the playground and learned how to play handball. When she came over to my house, she slurped mom's pozole instead of asking, what is this? In that supremely bitchy California girl accent, some white girls reserved for interrogating my mother's hospitality. The fifth grade race war proved Ida's racial solidarity. An Asian American child fired the first shots. She stood near me in the playground sand by the handball courts. She looked me up and down and said, your mother is a wetback. I lost control of my limbs. My hands attacked her and they shoved her chest, making her lose her balance and fall to the sand. My toes flew into her stomach. My Velcro shoes landed blow after blow. Her face winced and the bell rang. Recess was over. I quit kicking. She ran away crying. She didn't tell any grownups what had happened, but the fifth grade girls balkanized soon after. White girls from the English only classes refused to socialize with the girls from the bilingual classes. Looking at the jungle gym and tetherball courts, our segregation was clear as melanin. Clusters of girls named Lupe played together. Clusters of girls named Michelle played together. Lupe's and Michelle's did not mix. The playground felt dicey. From the jungle gym bars, a dangling white girl, Amy, called go back to Baja. Her taunt seemed aimed at both Ida and me. We paused beside the merry-go-round. I turned to Ida. Have you ever been to Mexico? I asked her. Ida shook her head. No, she answered, but I'd go with you. You would love it, I told her. The food is really good there. My uncle got his head cut off by a bus. The cockroaches fly. Really? I nodded. Amy screamed, Ida loves wetbacks. Ida screamed back, fuck your mother in the tit. I felt like hugging Ida. I'm not sure where she learned that comeback. Her mother did work for a gynecologist. Her father lived in Colorado and worked for the defense industry. Ida was so smart. Her favorite number was Googleplex. The balkanization and screaming drew our teachers outside. They decided they needed to fix things. They informed us that we were gonna have to sit down and talk about it. After lunch, a male teacher marched the boys to the blacktop to play dodgeball. Girls got herded into the English only classroom. I stared at the boys through tinted windows. My skin felt jealous. I didn't want to be inside. So prodded the English only teacher, what is going on? She stood by the board. She folded her arms. She was dressed entirely in purple. The white girls sat on the opposite side of the classroom in desks facing ours. They blinked at us, we blinked back. I raised my hand. The English only teacher said, go ahead. I pointed at the lot of them and said, 
they call us wetbacks and they tell us to go back to Mexico. Those girls are racists and she's not even Mexican. I pointed at Ida. Ida nodded. White lower lips quivered. White eyes grew glassy. One by one, the white girls burst into tears. Ida and all the Mexican girls looked at each other like, seriously? Apologize for making them cry, said the English only teacher. Sorry, I said, without any sincerity. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Um, we'll continue with Faye Hernandez. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for that. Um, I'm uh, really excited and grateful to be here. Thank y'all for uh, letting me be part of this. Um, I'm with amazing panelists and great organizers. And so um, I'm gonna perform a piece um, and then I'll read some of my new work. Oh yeah, my new book just came out, so get it from my website because that's how I make the most money. <laughs> there is a woman dug beneath the rubble, this male body. She pushes against my male pelvis, her coffin door to rise from this grave every morning. She tickles the tongue avidly, finding ways to snicker or howl her way out of me. My father doesn't know I'm his daughter too. He doesn't know how this single woman has built a whole colony in me. This woman wants my father to see all of the tiny woman that she's prepared for war, even at the expense of all of them dying unseen. She is a herbologist teacher that pulls trees from seeds and boils herbs that cure ineptitude. She is a soldier that trains a woman in me to carry guns and arms instead of men. She is wide eyed, thick, brown and big lipped, the tones of mestizaje. When I was little, I would run around in circles chasing my own shadow and I would see her from my periphery sitting at her throne wings tucked in while all the tiny woman in me prayed to uphold my uterus in the air as if it were a God in need of holding. They tucked prayers into my womb to keep me alive, submerged me under ocean water during endless gender dysphoric, dysphoric body dysmorphic nights. These women, they trail the streets singing, candles lit, scripts unfurled and always cr clutch me when I fall out of my own skin. And that's when I realized that I was the mother deity I sought to be. I soared down from the furthest sun, held a claw to my face and shaved the man that had caged me, wore red blood lipstick, rewrote Bibles and honored all of my tiny woman with crown pieces, wild haired. I doved for myself, wings outstretched and dug my talons into my own heart and proclaimed my victory in this war. This body is her body. This body is my body. This body is our body. And that's when I stepped into the temple of me and saw all of the tiny woman in me, chalk in hand against blackboard, solving the mystery of how I got stuck in this body and how the hell I'm gonna tell my father I'm his daughter too. Thank you, that's my first piece. Um, I'm gonna do two more. So there's this new piece that I wrote. My homegirl Jada gave me this sick ass prompt, like, so hard this bitch was like you gotta study clouds and you gotta like use their actual name in it and i'm like bitch i don't care about any of that but anyways this this and, and they told me title this piece after sappho i don't even know if i'm saying that right s-a-p-p-h-o anyways so here's the thing circus sorry serious clouds brush the sky when i the prodigal daughter was pulled out of the earth a simple slice opened me to mommy I didn't need Aquila's hoaxing to lure me back into my jaundiced body. I wanted to weep. I wanted to wake the world. I wanted to reconstruct my body the way maps do, line after line, a lie, state after state of falsity, the body, mind to rearrange. With chariot yoked to thy fleet winged coursers, we drag the misfortune of love and Beatrix with us. Our natives, our native relatives waved from their side of the border. We were wild, rough legged buzzards marking our new migration trail. The stratus clouds wrapped us with visas in our dry bills and God on our journey. I met the wet disease rheumatic fever at eight. No health insurance, but she took me to the American hospital praying there was enough sand to dry me. 
I was too a bronia angustifolia to survive the migration to Los Angeles. Migration that kept our last breath reserved for emergencies. Migration that I only recall in cellular memory, but that Lechuguilla tell me about in dreams. A simple slice down my Mexican passport gives me permission to return. What more can we give up to return? Alhina is so far, but she instigates my inner workings to return to the me before rebirth. Did I fail to yield like Viga in a past life? And nation state governments my punishment in this one? Mommy couldn't carry the dangling bones of me into the hospital, but she never stopped apologizing to all the soap tree yucca she kicked to get here. Our chariot was not made of gold, only sage thrasher feathers and ocotillo flowers. I know that mami can be Cerro Mojinora in its fruiting days, angry and full of lava, but as of late, she is extinct, her feet no longer capable of running. She is the fume, a volcano with no exit. She is dormant to life. I once flew over the Barrancas del Cobre as a Chihuahuan raven after we argued one dreadful evening after evening. I always made it to the other side of the land's hurt. By a river on the other side, a Taramara woman told me I was mixed with ash because that's the only way to understand justice, she said, impurity. I don't remember my car seat, the petroleum stench across the roads, border patrol, a third plane. I remember growing up like Achilles. The world was always mine. Mommy gave me the space to call my wisps of hair across the desert. She gave me all the time. That's my second piece. Thank you. I hear the roaring crowd and the snaps. I miss it. I miss the stage. Like, y'all, y'all playing me right now. I can't. Um, this last piece is after one of my homegirls' poem in another life. So Janelle Pineda is a Salvadoran poet. Her book is coming out. Don't play, don't sleep on her work. Um, it's coming out soon, I think 2021 in January. By uh, It was published by Hey Market. Am I saying that right? Um, anyways, this piece is titled Conception and it's after Janelle Pineda's In Another Life. The migration never happened but somehow you and I still exist. Like desert rose, we only know the memory of crystalline petals and not the tumbling that created us. Forget the almost gunned down pregnant woman, my mom, the jealous wife, the caldo de res. There is no bus to the maquiladoras. There is no border. There is no drowning. There is only ocotillo and tortillas hechas a mano the pink house and the backyard wall decorated with broken blue and yellow tile, a heaping plate of orejas and abuelitas canela cafe waiting to be disappeared into our bellies. In this life, our people are not things of city, but whole worlds living amongst the mountains, plains, and deserts. Everywhere, we are a pronghorn antelope when we tire of our bodies, playing freely, naked, and fed, Tronadera does not mean gunshot and tunas bloom in every place water gallons are left behind. My name will still mean faith, this time in a language that recognizes me, in a language I know how to speak. My grandmother is still a singer, although I am not a writer. In this life, I don't have to be. This poem somehow still exists. It is told in my mother's native songs and she makes worry dissolve like lime in, in warm honey, throat refreshed and free of silence. You and I do not leave each other across the border grasping angrily at each other's heart in search of stay. We meet in the grassy hills by Santa Isabel, my arms overflowing with lunch and Vicente Fernandez CDs and together we graze the clouds passing before your 1966 Ford pickups windshield. We watch sunset fall over a land we call our own and don't fear its stripping. I bite into your lips, softly, sucking color from substance, nibbling the memory of today's conception. Our laughter's echoes across the surface of the river, one where we don't fear our finding. We do not have to hide here. We do not have to hide anywhere. 
a gray fox skids somewhere across the river, and I do not fear my child's taking. Damn, I felt that one. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for having me, for holding space, for bearing witness to new work. Um, I'm excited to hear whoever's next. Thank you, Faye. Next is Essay. Yes! I'm glad to be next so I can say that. I was tempted to pull out uh, reggae air horns, but I will wait for the Q&A. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, well, I don't really know um, true happiness, but let, let's keep moving. Um, I'm glad to see your faces and those that I can see. Um, I'm gonna read um, that second one, Faye, is really moving. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of poems. Um, shout out to Christy Young in the chat. Um, from Proclivity. And then one that I worked on with Faye. Um, okay. Um, I want to do what Miriam did and offer like elegant like context, but I think the context is that the world is anti-Black and I have father issues, so let's go. Um, this first one is Evolver. I'm gonna zoom in because I can't see for shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just got back and I already feel the need to time travel again. Not the way that white folks love to fetishize its possibilities. You know, the chance to touch everything and say they were there, spread their imperiousness across every dimension. What even is whiteness if not the ultimate butterfly effect? Except all the butterflies are undead, actually. Emaciated moths and made of stone. And wherever they land, it's yours. Yours whose flesh they infect and turn inside out. You who they made believe the world was nothing but monarchs. I don't need that kind of time travel. Never wanted to be blue, the fifth element, the poor baboso with the rich forehead using militarized hand gestures, the madman and comically long scarves whizzing around alone for centuries in a telephone box. I want to do it the kindred way, dizzying along my own time stream, rent sideways from oblivion, back to 2012 so I could say no, and never know the treachery of Highway 17 or the genders I left there. Back to December 26, 2010, so I could say something like, let go, or does it hurt? I went back to September 2001, to May 1965, to December 1948, September 1984, August 1962, to July 1960, or 1493, some shit like that. And there's the fetish, I knew it would come. I want then, congealing right there in the 60s so I could tell my father to get off that plane. I'd say, turn back around, not yet, daddy. Tell him how things are better in Limon, how it's hard, but you'll miss yourself in the end, how they'll do their best to break you. So let's just stay here in the fields. We can build here, I said, but my hands are becoming apparitions. I would have reappeared, embraced in the shadows of the broad Welch beech trees in the middle of whispering to my mother how she doesn't need to stay. Remember that, I plead, there under her childhood bed, materializing at night once the candles go out, preparing her a life of letting go too soon. I will have raced through throngs of dark young men in wide brim hats and two long neckties queued up there along the Kingston docks. Want to thrust myself into, myself into my ungrandfather's arms in June 1948 and beg him not to do it. Get the fuck off the boat, Mass Wilmot. Don't do this to us. The future is always already here but I'm stuck and not so sure anymore. Flight attendants call up security as my father kisses Abuela and Tia Maria and steps on the plane. The Windrush men brush me off my grandfather because I'm debris, but I show them then. I leave an imprint of tears and snot and blood, nail beds still bleeding like the Shroud of Turin on a Sunday best. Can see Madge shooing me out of my mom's house and I'm rapidly clawing at the floor as they pull me by my leg from under the bed. And it's always like that always bringing me back here, like a moth to a flame, head first to the moon, unable to save us or the others, waiting to undo myself again. That's the first one. There's no applause, so I'm just gonna take a little whiskey break, so. It, it's, you know, my fan. 
Um, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read this one that I did uh, in concert with Faye because every chance I get to see Faye on the screen, um, I wanna shout out one of the more moving spiritual collaborations that I've had the privilege to do. It was for last year's um, Trans Day of Remembrance that Forward Together put on. I'm definitely gonna put the image in the chat. And also I put the shop that Faye Hood Criatura is on so you can um, buy their art, definitely cop that book. Um, it's called An Offering. Stop me if you've heard this one before so that I can tell it again and savor it. I am here, yet they think of me as a relic, not forgotten, but unglorified, a rough beast with a hashtag accent of defeat, a weak heart and a Bethlehem slouch. I often find myself both sought after and shunned, unable to speak my own name if I wanted, eternally emptied, made to mourn the loss of any meaning I might yet make. Like a silenced clap of thunder, technicolor turned to ashes. It seems so many I've loved have wanted me dead, ground down into the ancestral mosaic of past and present gods. Earthly siblings, sweet apparitions, can we sanctify ourselves into new life? I cannot warn the others of the coming storm alone, cannot take shelter from storms already here and look, just look. Everywhere blood clings to the leaves, soot gnaws at the lungs, there's no water for miles and soon all you can say is, well, we should have listened for the thunder. So I was not the first to dream another world, to crave, crave the teeming darkness of the ocean floor, stories I would never fully know. With this, I exalt myself, shape shift into my harbinger skin. We have always been on the move. Live and wild and dangerous, we grow new lungs, spread our palms across the dirt and tend to new leaves. And I can never forget the body that came before. Acidic grief dries out along the cracks in this new flesh. Phantom bruises from when them did hush up the clap and teeth the color. I divine myself as a shumare, a messenger with an offering that you may call me rainbow serpent, sibling, lover, or freedom traveler. That in case language doesn't express desire but hides it, you must remember to reach only for the neither thing to be righteously unashamed of this grief until the otherwise comes. Until that time, we may name ourselves whole, if not holy, and stop eulogizing the project of living long enough to see that it is yet to come and so can never die. Okay, it's the last one. Um, it's called Languish. Um, call that because so I have a grandmother who says so my one prompt is from is from Tia Maria who uh doesn't speak English but uh the way that she said language um was always languish and when I learned what the word languish meant like this like really uh moody macabre word that I am um a fan of because I'm a moody bitch can we curse it's too late it's already happened um <laughs> that I sort of um had a prompt around um what it means to um to I guess migrate but not necessarily geographical right because especially if we're talking about black geographies a lot of it um is geographical psychic um emotional and others so this is about that Language. They said I'd never know the word depravity until I left you. And so for the second time today, I leave you for words. To be fair, I've mispronounced my whole self into these knots. One never dreams of inhabiting a linear world until the ending is near, when you suddenly cannot help but imagine it. So this one is for being. Corrugated listless limbs and flighty synapses still refuse to speak on the matter. Now, have we really always been so permanent as that? The way all our language crowns pull joyous and anchor back in from being dropped through the heavy dark. And as the blinding third of sickening contact with axles spinning through now muddy lawns, as the bells outside sound helplessly. We slept before we made our way inside, the midnight and white flowers watching. She wept before we made our way upstairs, began breaking a window by opening it. And now there is a chorus that repeats itself. And while on our kneecaps, we cannot listen since we are too busy wanting to learn over and over again how to solve loneliness 
how to become thieves filling rucksacks on rooftops. I watched the mystery of the same weddings of science and myth that the Greeks did. I built a boat out of berries and birch branches, tried to row it up a mountain instead of just changing the boat. I waited for the sea to rise and for the rock to liken itself to an island, waited for the earth to library its boulders in a languid city. I walked with my arms out, picking bricks off of the corners, swallowing things without names that do not care if they make my stomach hurt. As I sit in this room, <laughs> sorry. As I sit in this bedroom, as I dress like a ghost and dance to the sound of swords marking the trees with their sharpness, the pinpoint marks where they are, kittening along overgrown motorways, head tilted to the map, glancing from time to time at the flanking boxy brick buildings, inscrutable signs announcing street junctures, the skyline hosts telephone vines and buildings sequoia tall. Lights lick the evening air. No place else smells like here. Wind sweeping ocean sent across town, the sweet sear of Gallo Pinto hints of forest around the edge. You're thinking earth or assembly line or what anchors person to place. You're considering fidelity and wondering if you're even capable, but that woman, that woman is showing her midnight shoulder in the curl of each bridge with her lacquered geometry stopping you cold. That's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Essie. And our last reader will be uh, Christopher Soto. All right. Thank you everyone for your poems and for the space. Uh, come on, open up tabs. There we go. Two Lovers in Perfect Synchronicity. In 1991, Felix Gonzalez Torres made an installation in memoriam of his boyfriend, Ross Laycock, who died of AIDS in Los Angeles. The installation was comprised of candies individually wrapped in multicolor cellophane. The pile of candies weighed 175 pounds or Ross's ideal body weight before he contracted AIDS. Throughout the day, visitors to the gallery ate the pile of candy and therefore diminished the body of Ross, depleting his weight like AIDS did. Then at night when everyone left the gallery, the curators could choose to replenish the pile of candy, restoring Ross to his original weight and granting him eternal life or not. This poem is dedicated to our queer mentors that we never had a chance to meet, especially Ross and Felix. We were born the year Ross died of AIDS in Los Angeles, our baby back toasted and tattooed, our neck sweat, sweet, wet, back, beaner, spick, speaking Spanglish, our clothes clinged on the clothesline, the swing swung on the swing set, we were wearing beach sand, sand dollars, sand crabs, summer skin so tanned. We were born and Felix was mourning Ross, the lost him of him. Pour one out, y otra, pa arriba, pa abajo, centro. Free tequila for the kids, spray paint, painting our names at the wash. Mango y aguaste at the punk show. We wanted to believe masturbations, sex with someone you love, but still we're a part, a part of a whole generation of queer youth being raised without elders, who is Ross to us, a whole generation lost to AIDS, our lady of constant descent, a little gory allegory. Hugo, our true love, Hugo de Naranja, when we broke up, he broke down. We were all ribs and on the barbecue. He played the xylophone with his tongue. Inflatable pool in the front yard, yellow grass, cage macaws, palm trees, tilted pool tables, the dog with knotted hair, junk glass with socks on the beach, seashell buckets, cocinando con mi mamá, cocinando pupusas de queso con loroco, bebiendo con la champán, the boom box, Pokemon, graffiti walls, and skater boys. No shirt, bony as greyhounds. Hugo's plaid boxers peeking out of dicky shorts. He rode 
on the pegs of our bike, the ice cream truck over Celia Cruz, piñata, tarot cards, hoop earrings, aerosol cans. We reapply eyeliner like a chola before mall photos, eloteros, football, Sunday church, pachata, cumbia, no rain, curanderas, campesinos, theo transcribed at the seance. We pretended to get stigmata. Oh, to Vangar, oh, North Hollywood, oh, Placita Olvera, oh, San Pedro, oh, Long Beach, oh, Taqueria and Westminster, oh, the 405 freeway, left arm sunburnt, Pachucos cross, windows down, we were on the beach chairs, beach coolers, beach bums, butts, peanut butter, and jelly sandwiches, witch chips in the sand, Pringles or ruffles, vodka watermelon, suntan lotion, and we laughed with towels over our head. Police said, are you drunk? Are you high? And we reply, no, we're Salvadoran. Police harassed us so much. We stopped driving, we stopped biking. We moved to a different city. Police asked, drivers, lice, scents, our red rubbed eyes, our brown skin, our brown, we didn't jog the stop sign, we didn't pass the speed limit, turn signal, our music wasn't too loud. No queremos hablar contigo, hold on. And it's amongst these conditions we love, we try to. Homeboy is beautiful. Felix and Ross, Hugo and us on the down low, low riders and smog, homie. Ho, he, hugging, the stomach of our pelo con boca cerrada, no entran tumbleweeds and cactus and every day at the museum, visitors walk to the installation, a pile of candies individually wrapped, multicolor cell phones. The visitors were looking for Ross, looking for UFOs and our family of aliens in the rose bush. Iron welded gate, weed whackers pushing lawn mowers over flinching finches. Electric tidal capitalism crashed over us. When prisons close, we hope there are no museums for pain where tourists can safely visit nobody while homies are held in solitary around this country. We made phone calls to our deaf friends, telling them to hurry to the hospital that Ross holds the angles of angels. Have you heard the extreme loneliness of the pervert parade? Ross, we're here, baby. Everything will be all right, we wanted to say. But he was gone before we came with wet dreams of our cousins, twerking in the library, tweaking in the laundromat, feeling nauseous and agnostic, What's good? Where's God beneath the vacancy sign? Where's our therapist therapist? Maybe this is how we leave the hospital, the poem, the cemetery has fine typography. The ones we love, the fonts we need. Maybe we never breathed the cleanest air, visited Scandinavia, looked at auroras and their stretch marks, how Saturn lost her rings. Maybe the tour list was never meant to be completed. With Venus in retrograde, we tried not to drown while swimming backstrokes in roses and rosé with pit bulls named Rosie. Maybe one day we'll wake an oddity in the domestic and say, Russ, we're here. Where are you? Was that it? Was that life? We didn't do enough. We did so much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. That was beautiful and amazing. And I'm really glad I got to hear it um, with your own voices. Uh, just listening to it, I have to say that it made me really excited for you know, young aspiring writers or readers of poetry that exist right now because growing up, I didn't have voices like yours that I, I could hear from and that I could identify with. So it was really lovely to be able to identify with a lot of the experiences that you all presented. Um, 
So I just wanted to remind all of our audience that we will be now moving into a Q&A portion. And I have a few questions that I'd like to pose to all the panelists, but if you have any other questions or any responses um, to any of the works that you'd wanna drop in the Q&A function or in the chat, uh, we'll be looking at that as well. And we'll have the writers address that too. So I guess the first thing I wanted to ask about is something that you know came up, I think with everyone, which is the idea of really missing the communal aspect of going out and experiencing each other's art together in a space where we could touch and hear each other constantly without the screen in front of us. So I wanted to ask you, what kind of spaces exist now? Or do you have any advice to people who really do love poetry of where they could go to find the same sort of communion out there online that maybe somebody who's not immersed in the poetry world is aware of? I mean, I could give a very simple answer. I would just probably Google poetry and or poetry <laughs> organizations. And then there'll probably be like four or five predominant, like four or five prominent poetry organizations that come up at the top of the Google search. And then I'd probably just follow them on Twitter. And a lot of them will be like retweeting poets or have events. Um, and that's just a really easy way to get started in terms of knowing who's, um, uh, knowing some poets. Um, I would also add there is um, Ariana Bosco. Uh, she runs an open mic called Recess Mic. Um, that's every Thursdays um, at 9, 9 p.m. So folks can just like sign up. Um, so if y'all follow Palms Up Academy um, on Instagram, you can see all of those details. It's a super dope space. There's also the Poetry Lounge. I don't know if they're doing anything currently, um, but I know that there's like writing workshops available via like Slam Workshop. Um, I think last week was their last one for the year. Um, but yeah, there's there's those two spaces that um, that I have to offer to invite y'all to visit. Um, I can add something. Uh, can you guys hear me? Oh, okay, cool, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I wasn't sure. Um, I think Long Beach Girl Collective might host events. I know that they have been hosting study groups and I know that in the past they used to host readings and they might also be hosting readings online. Um, and so I would recommend checking them out. They have like an active um, Instagram account. Um, uh, they are LB Girl Collective. I'm looking at them on Instagram right now. And yeah, they do have a queer feminist open mic. Um, so that, that could be something to check out as well. Thanks. Um, a lot of times when people attend our events, we have a lot of aspiring artists and writers who check these out. Can you talk a little bit about your own journey in getting your voice amplified and getting published? Did you go the self-publishing route? Um, how, how did you kind of manage your career to get to where you are now? Oh no, do I have to go first? Can I do nose goes again? <laughs> I don't want to go first and say, uh, I didn't go last time because I uh, don't leave my house. But I did, I, when I was thinking <laughs> about it, um, what I did want to add, because um, everyone else gave really um, useful answers. Um, my antisocial answer is <laughs> maybe to get started, maybe like it's a community like any other, right? Like the writing community or poetry community or whatever, right? And um, it may not, it, maybe it's not as useful to like figure out as your first step what all is out there in the poetry world, capital P, when you want to figure out what's going on in your home. So my my favorite poets are people that will claim they never wrote a bit of poetry, right? Like I learned about feminism from my mother who is 
not a feminist, but I absolutely learned what it meant to like um, show up for like the, like the rights of women, people of color, black people, right? Not queer people working on that. Um, and so for poetry, I would say like find find a friend or a family member if they're down with that and just read to them, figure out your own voice to a bunch of stuffed animals in your room, you know what I mean? Before like going out there and trying to be like a poet because poetry doesn't need um, an audience. It needs you and your voice. So I guess that's what I would say. Um, and note that that doesn't involve you going anywhere. So <laughs> it works for me. Um, I think um, the voice question for me is an interesting one. So I want to hand it off to like, like dope published people. Um, I get in my own way a lot of the time. And so it's like an anti-career story in terms of having written like hundreds of pages of poems and like, but have been, having been like corrupted by academia or the university <laughs> and feeling stressed out about like, let me just send it out. Let me just close my eyes and like, I'm the shit. My friends are hyping me up. Like, <laughs> let me just, instead I like self peer review, you know what I mean? And so, um, my journey has, um, especially when I like, I've been digging, I don't want to say deeper, but like checking more in with myself and talking a lot more about my family, um, talking a lot, <laughs> as I think of <laughs> alluding to earlier about like Latinidad and identity questions and things that um, have been like plaguing me, but also like taking shape around and outside of me and all of my communities or people, human beings who matter. Um, as I've been doing that, my career trajectory has more been about, um, again, the thing I was saying about um, starting out in poetry, figuring out my own voice, and also understanding that as a, you know, being Black, being trans, non-binary, um, depending on which um, racist person you ask, being Latinx, <laughs> um, you know, like, coming to terms with myself and my own identities has also meant um, what we know ancestrally, which is that we've been communicating ourselves in and beyond genres before you were like the like creative nonfiction or the, like the literature section or the this section, we have been writing and producing and creating knowledge. And so my career, the career question for me has been more like a, let me remember that. Let me remember what my ancestors did. Like my grandmother couldn't write, but again, is one of the best poets, the best writers I've ever, you, you know, hearing her string a sentence together in any language, right? And so, yeah, maybe that was too long an answer, but um, yeah. So like trusting, if not myself, because I struggle with that, trusting um, my ancestry and also just, um, it's been easier to be, I'm a sad person, you know, like sad boy for life, but it's been easier to be angry about these broader systemic issues. And so if I can't trust my voice or that has been hard, I recognize it more as a byproduct of colonialism. And so now I'm like, fuck colonialism and fuck white people. That helps my career go forward a little bit faster, if that makes sense. Because I'm not, I'm not holding myself down or letting like broader structures do that. I wanted to add um, to, to what SA was saying about um, voice and like you were mentioning um, like reading to like stuffed animals in your room, like, and, and like, I actually do that and I still do that. Like I, um, I'm more of a prose writer than I am a poet, but I'm very devoted to the musicality of language and I'm very devoted to um, orality. And so when I write something, I never write something with the intent of it only living on the page. I it write with the intent that it's also going to live through my breath. And so the way that things sound is of like critical importance to me. And so I read all of my work aloud, all of it. I don't give a shit what it is. I'm gonna read it aloud to make sure that there's music in it. And one of the techniques that I use if there's no human being around to read to is I read to a fucking stuffed animal and I keep a stuffed animal on my writing desk. And like, when I'm ready, I'm like, are you ready? And I turn and I read to the animal and like the animal holds me accountable because it has a face. Do you know what I mean? And, I, <laughs> and like, that is how I preserve my voice. And that's how I make sure that there's music in in what I'm doing and then one of the other things that I did years and years ago was I understood that like I needed to develop as a writer and a reader and a speaker and I understood that my queer elders had a tremendous amount of wisdom to offer and so I sought queer mentors 
And, um, and I found a queer mentor in Long Beach. She's since passed away. She was Tatiana de la Tierra. She was a Colombian poet. Um, but I essentially sort of like apprenticed myself to her and offered myself to her. I would do anything she asked. Like, I don't even like cats, but I would clean her litter box because I was like, you, well, I'm a cat person now in part because of her, but like, <laughs> but like, uh, but like, queer elders and queer mentorship, especially like sort of poetic queer mentorship and artistic queer mentorship really matters. And so I, I would I would offer that route to to I'm um, to young queer people too. like older queer people, I think, have a responsibility to younger queer people and to offer, you know, whatever resources it, it is that we have to to all to everybody in our community, in particular young folks. Maybe you'll story tell there too. Um, nah, <laughs> since we brought that the into it, uh, I'll go. I'll go the. I'll go the. I I tagged onto Miriam. <laughs> Miriam. <laughs> Miriam has known me since. Oh, I think oh, longer than anyone in the poetry community. I think, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, because um, Griselda Suarez. Uh, was my mentor at Cal State Long Beach and Griselda, Miriam Gurba and Tatiana, Tatiana de la Tierra were part of this writer's collective called Was Las Guayabas. And I was just like, who are these people? They're the coolest, can I be like them? And yeah, I, I still think that. <laughs> So I guess um, uh, Miriam touched upon this, right? In that you write both prose and poetry and in kind of looking at your works, I noticed that the majority of you also go between different forms of writing. Can you talk about maybe how you choose what form your writing is gonna take and how the form influences what you have to say or the audience that you're seeking? Um, I'll take this one. So when I'm trying to go off, I write an essay. Uh, because I can bring research in, I can add a little cute footnote at the bottom and be like, to y'all who don't understand me in any other way, here's a footnote. Um, I'm not like an academic freak or nothing, but like, you know, I, I dabble between worlds where I'm just like writing uh, for the work to exist in multiple places. So like essays are for, um, you know, just for me to articulate things more detailed. A poem is more like, depending on what kind of poem, most of my poems have this musicality that Miriam was talking about because I do do performance poetry. I go on stage and I perform a lot of my work. Um, but the interesting part is how do you translate a performance into page? And that is what guides a lot of my work. Um, this, uh, like if a lot of my work plays with form because of the musicality, the performance elements, the presence, right? Because if we're trying to immortalize ourselves, right? Faye will not exist someday. And because this work is essential, I feel like I try to find a way to bring life into the work. Um, it's like a, like a futuristic hologram of like me or my voice or the experience through the work. Um, so it's not so much a choice. I think the content chooses what it wants to be. And I just let it do its thing, you know? I let it march in its own way. Like I started writing this uh, novel. So, oh, this is like low key, I shouldn't even be talking. But I like started working on this like novel, right? And then it turned into a, a short film script. And I was like, oh, okay. So it chose what it wanted to be. And, and you know, it's a lot of just trusting the work, tr trusting the ancestry, right? Like essay brought that up. Like, I think I just listen and, and the works like, I wanna be a poem today. I wanna be a long poem. I wanna be an essay or a screenplay. So that's my long winded answer. Yeah, I think like I was saying earlier, uh, everything Faye is saying really resonates. Um, I think that, um, you know, we have it in Spanish, in other Romance languages, like the relationships between genre and gender. And, and so, like, 
I believe, <laughs> I mean, not even a belief system um, because of facts and because I can also cite references, that's when academic language for me is useful. When people are like, uh, no, that's like a new thing. I'm like, uh, per my research and the six languages that I speak, I see here in 1412 that your gender is a Babylon thing. It's bullshit, it's fake, you're basic, right? So that becomes really easy. And the same thing is also, I think, with genre, right? There are so many cultures and communities, some of which I'm from, that have like a millennia or more of oral history, oral poetics, like people can just stand up there and like read the poem of their entire culture for the past 500 years, just from memory. And so if I had to like in this like eternal 2020 sit down and say, uh, I'm going to write a poem about this, that for me is already, um, I don't know, like losing the plot, you know, it feels like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole or like fit my ancestors into colonialism and I'm unwilling to do either thing. So we're down to the last few minutes of the session and I wanna give you a chance to talk about what you've been doing recently or what's coming up next. I know that a couple of you recently had new projects published, I believe. We talked about it in the emails that were going back and forth as we're setting up. And also please feel free to drop any links into the chat of where people can purchase your art. Do you want me to volunteer who goes first? Um, how about Faith? Sorry, I was typing on the chat. Um, oh, am I talking? Okay. Um, so the project that I'm most focused on right now is a collection of essays. Um, and it's because I realized that in my six to seven year journey of getting my poetry work published, which is a whole like systematic fraudulent thing that I'm not gonna deconstruct right now um, because it took so long to get to where I am now, which is having my first full length poetry collection out into the world. Um, I had to find different ventures, right? Because I was aching to create different a different voice for myself. I don't wanna be Faye the poet. I'm just Faye the fucking, I don't know, writer, ho bitch who like is trying to change the world. Like, I don't know. So I was writing essays as I was getting commissioned for like auto straddle or um, immigrant report and I found so much liberation through those through those um, outlets and those mediums and so um, I wrote a lot of essays and I'm like I can't just let them drown out in the internet I need to put them together and continue to write more and create this resource book of essays that can potentially help other people deconstructing the myth of Latinidad deconstructing what is race within the context of Latinidad addressing white privilege and privileges in general, um, and all of the different intersections that go into identity that people tend to brush over, like, come on. So that's my project right now. Um, and additional to that, um, I got this artist residency through um, uh, Rogers Park uh, artist, um, artist residency in Inglewood. Um, so I'll be making a collection of paintings and a poetry film devoted to queer trans people of color, black indigenous folk from Inglewood specifically to commemorate us because this is the landmark I want people to know, not just the forum or these new institutions that they're creating in Inglewood to gentrify my people. So that's the project I'm working on right now. So, yeah. Essie, I think you had something recent too, right? <laughs> um, did I? Wow. Um, sorry, Zoom rooms are delightful places. Um, yeah, I mean, I publish a, a few poems that have come out recently and a few more that will come out um, in the in a few weeks, I guess, in the new, new Western year. Um, Shout out to um, my dear friend Morgan Parker and Vicky Vertiz, um, two really phenomenal poets, because the thing I was saying about getting in my own way, it really was like, 
Um, and I guess, sorry to go back, uh, Gabriela, but you know, like to the first question about like how people get started and going out, it really does like reading like to it, to your pets, to inanimate objects in your space. And then also to your homies who will have your back no matter what is like really useful for them to just like hold my face virtually and be like, bitch, what are you talking? Like publish this, like put this out there um, has been really useful. So I'm hoping um that uh, my book of poetry will be out um i also have a book of essays that i'm working on about um black trans embodiment and non-binary identity um it's and it's also wrapped up in like blackness latinidad and like caribbean aesthetics and identity um because to me they're all like really bound up together and sometimes um i'm i spend a lot of time like in my head and like hopefully all of us who are able to stay out, if we're able to stay at home um, and not have to like work and go outside, um, uh, you know, like being online um, is a way to connect with people. But then these Twitter streets also just like map out some pretty similar and familiar colonial lines, right? Where all of a sudden I like looked away and then I logged back on and now I'm BIPOC or now I'm these identities and those, and they don't speak to me or my communities. They don't actually um, resonate for me politically. And I kind of just want to write that down similar to but not even at the same level but similar to what Faye was talking about about like wanting to have some kind of guide and like be of use I want people it could be writers emerging or otherwise or just like people who are just out here to know that we don't especially younger folks <laughs> especially folks online extremely online people who are like finding their identity and like going towards like different terminology and being like, this is the term, right? Like we don't actually have to keep moving with the trends of like linear Western time. We can slow down and come to know ourselves ancestrally. We don't have to like always be moving forward <laughs> like to, to, to name ourselves and know ourselves fully. And so I'm yeah, writing essays about that. And then I saw in the chat, um, Miriam, you were talking about a magazine. Do you want to give us a little more information about that? Sure. Um, so I, um, I launched a new magazine recently that is part of the Brick House Cooperative. And that is a cooperative of um, journalists um, and artists. There are several magazines um, that exist within that umbrella. And the one that I launched is called Tasteful Rude. And it's a magazine of criticism, commentary, and analysis. Um, and we're interested in everything except for the um, cisgendered white male gaze. <laughs> like that's, 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 tabled and on the sidelines. So um, so I dropped um, a link there and um, it's a very, very new magazine. Most recently we published um, an interview with Brontes Purnell about his new book, 100 Boyfriends, which is gonna be coming out on um, FSG in February. And then we've also published an essay which is critical of Latinidad by Jessica Hoppe. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so if anybody would care to pitch us, um, I'm the editor, so I would be the person I'm um, reviewing those pitches. And then I'm currently working on a proposal for an essay collection that is tentatively titled creep, and it is an informal sociology of creeps. Um, and I'm paying particular attention to political creeps, literary creeps and romantic creeps. <laughs> Fantastic. And then Christopher, would you like to talk about anything recent or what's next for you? Um, yeah, I'm moving to El Salvador and just, <laughs> um, just in early 2021 for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go write and do that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. And uh, as somebody who works at the Museum of Latin American Art, Latinidad is something that we're constantly always arguing about and discussing. So I'm definitely going to look out to what you all are writing about that. We're going to keep the room open for a couple more minutes. If our audience would like to um, comment or respond to any of the writers, and then the writers, if you'd like to add any more links to where people can purchase, you know, your artwork, your writing, um, or where they can learn more about you or see your latest feature. That would be fantastic. 
So once again, thank you everybody for participating with us today. This is, I think, our first literary event that we've done um, since we closed down the museum. And I can't think of a better group of writers to have done this with. It's so nice to meet most of you for the first time here at this event. Um, and I look forward to hopefully partnering with you all again soon. So everybody stay safe and healthy uh, and um, stay close to your loved ones.